Welcome to the Renaissance Church Podcast. Our mission is to glorify God and to make disciples by bringing the gospel into all of life in all the earth. This is Chris Kipp, lead pastor of Renaissance Church here in Richmond, Texas. And if you've not joined us in a worship gathering or at a house church yet, we would love to have you join us. You can find out more information at rin-church.org. And I pray that you are encouraged and edified by the proclamation of God's word today. This morning, I want to look at Luke chapter 10, if you have a copy of the scriptures and want to go there with me. If you don't, that's okay. We're going to have it on the screen for you. If you have an app on your phone that you read the Bible with, you can go to Luke chapter 10. And we're going to look at a very hands-on moment with Jesus and his disciples. This is really kind of a shift that is happening in the life of Jesus. And uh, I was thinking this week about... uh, my, my boys, I have three boys, and they are kind of in those teenage years, and there's a lot of video game playing going on in my house, okay? That's just the reality. They love to play video games. And that means that at the dinner table, when we're eating, many times, one of them will start to describe people, characters, missions, objectives, obstacles, things in the game, and honestly... As they're talking, like my brain's just shutting off. Does that make sense? Like it's just a foreign world to me. Like I don't even know what you're talking about. Like I know that those things exist, but that does not compute to me. The reason why I tell you that is um, I was invited to a a thing called the Amazing Shake competition where um, at Jane Long, they have these students that, you know, they write essays and they sort of have to like make the cut. And what they do is they have all these people from the community come and we're supposed to dress up. So I, this is like too casual for this. They want me to wear a suit and they want me to look intimidating because what they want to do is to train these young people how to basically in the future go to a job interview. And so they, they walk up and they shake your hand and they say, hello, what is your name? And then I say, oh, my name is Chris Kipp. And they say, oh, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a pastor. And then I saw a look on their face of like, what in the world is a pastor? Like they just weren't ready for that. So I said, do you know what that is? To which, and this happened both years, one of the students said, no. And what I realized is that we, uh, we live in a culture that is full of Christian things. There are Christian movies and Christian television shows like The Chosen. Lots of people have seen. There are Christian buildings, churches that people drive past every day. There are uh, Christian websites and blog posts and reposts on social media and all that kind of stuff. Like, and if you're a Christian, you know about all that stuff, and that's the world that you live in. But for many people, it's like so foreign to them. It's like me listening to my sons talk about video games. It's like that does not compute. And I think that we assume way too much about what people know about the good news of Jesus. That many people really, they just don't know. They know that there is such a thing as Christianity. They know that there are churches, but they don't really know what the gospel, what the good news of Jesus is really all about. And uh, I, I was thinking this week about our area. So when we planted our church about five years ago, there were, in a five-mile radius of this building, there were 200,000 people at that time. 200,000 people, which is this is a lot of people. And as I was studying you know, the, the data, from what I could understand is about 60% of those people were either, they, they were unaffiliated with any sort of religious group of any kind, which meant that about 120,000 people that live within a five mile radius of this building at that time were disconnected at least from the church or maybe Christianity was completely foreign to them. They didn't have a a real knowledge of Christ. So I was just curious, like, what is it now? And the projected 
population for this year, 2024, is 232,500 people within a five mile radius. That's amazing that in five years, there are over 30,000 more people that live within a five mile radius. Now, I don't have the data, but my guess is that lots of them are still disconnected at very least from the church. And many of them do not have an understanding of who Jesus is. So then I started thinking, what if, what if, what if we could reach 1% of 232,500 people? So out of every 100 people that live within a five mile, five mile radius, now many of you drive further than five miles to get here, right? So I'm just talking about the people within five mile radius. That would be 2,325 people in this church body. Now, would that excite you or would that scare you a little bit? You can be honest, it's okay. Because in our area, in Houston, there's sort of a, a love-hate relationship with mega, right? Especially mega churches. And uh, sometimes, as uh, Greg Mott came and spoke at a conference that I was at this week, and he said, you know, if you're not in a large church, it's easy to throw stones at them sometimes. Um, and I think when we think about the fears maybe associated with reaching a large number of people, I think sometimes we're afraid of becoming a different kind of church, right? And, and you could say, well, you know, we're afraid that it would be too production-y, or we're afraid that it would be too consumeristic-y, or we're afraid that it would be whatever, like fill in whatever word. But I'm just talking about like this church, like the one you're at right now, like this, this congregation right here, without like becoming some, something else, what if we could reach a large number of people for Jesus? Would that excite you? Or would that scare you? And the question might be more, instead of asking what do I want in a church, maybe we should be asking, Lord, what do you want in your church? And I have a feeling that the one who came to seek and save the lost is still here to seek and save the lost. Amen? So my thought is, like, how might we see the good news of Jesus spread here within a five-mile radius of this building. I, I years ago preached a message. It's been so long that I can't, I can't find the message. But it, it was called The Miracle of the Blue Dot. And I, I went on Google Earth and I just searched churches in my area, churches nearby. And of course, all these blue dots, dots are populating on the map, right? If you've seen that. And then I thought, well, if I could zoom out to like, you know, our whole region, how many blue dots would there be? And then if I could zoom out to like the state of Texas, how many blue dots would there be? And then like, you know, the, the United States, how many blue dots would there be? And then if you could get even more data, like for every small group, house church, Bible study, men's group that meets in a, you know, cafe, like if you could find, if you could get a blue dot for every single one of those things, like how many dots would populate of all the Christians and the churches and groups and things that are happening? Like, I think you'd see a lot of blue dots, right? A lot, like more than you think. And then I was thinking, what if we could roll that back 2,000 years and we would watch all those blue dots fade away over time and they would all go back to this one blue dot in Jerusalem. Day of Pentecost, spirit comes, the church is born. How did the blue dot go from one all over the entire map? It's, it's quite amazing, really. I, I found this quote, and this is from Steve Cordell, he's a pastor. The book's called The Church in Many Houses, and here's what he writes. 
There has been no other life that has had more of an impact on the world than that of Jesus Christ. Virtually everyone readily acknowledges that Jesus Christ changed the course of human history. The impact of his life is all the more remarkable when we consider that he never used a telephone. He had no internet access and never appeared on television or in a newspaper. Jesus never wrote a book. Did you know that? He didn't personally write any of the gospel messages. He never wrote a book, nor did he ever travel far from his home. How then did Jesus influence the world as he did? It's a great question. He goes on to say that Jesus' strategy for changing the world was to train disciples who could make disciples of others. So all that, that one blue dot was all about pouring himself into people who could pour themselves into people. It's amazing. Okay, with that in your mind, let's look at Luke chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 1. What we're going to do is I want to break this up into two weeks. So next week, we're going to talk about the second half of this. I just want to read the first half of this section. And here's what uh, Luke writes. Luke is a doctor, by the way, Dr. Luke who was uh, not one of the 12 disciples, but was in an outer ring, kind of a second generation disciple of Jesus. And here's what he writes. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself was about to go. Verse two, he told them, the harvest is abundant but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now go. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. This is the word of the Lord. So we have this moment in the life of Jesus, and what's happening is in Luke 9, verse 51, it tells us that the days were coming to a close for him to be taken up, and he determined to journey to Jerusalem. So Jesus knows time is of the essence. Time is short, and there's um, what we call the stages of delegation. Jim Maxwell talks about this. The first stage is that I do it. The second stage is that I do it and you watch. The third stage is that we do it together. The fourth stage is you do it and I watch. And the fifth stage is you do it and I go to Tahiti, right? That's the fifth stage of delegation. You leave. They've got it. They're running with it. And Jesus knows he's about to ascend to the Father's glory. He's going to be seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's preparing them. And get this, there comes a point as you're following Jesus, where you can grow no further until you actually step out and lead something yourself. That was the last stage for his disciples. They they were sitting at his feet, absorbing his teaching, asking him questions. I mean, they were there with Jesus. We think, gosh, my faith would be so deep if I was there at the feet of Jesus. And that was actually not deep enough. He was saying, no, no, here's how you go deeper. You actually go out. You go out. And you begin to lead this yourself. And so Jesus, he, he kind of hands them the mission. But as he hands them the mission, he also hands them a dilemma. And it's a dilemma that we feel. And it's the dilemma that we were just talking about. And the way that he says it is this in verse 2a. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. What a dilemma. And we feel it here in the greater Houston area. So real quick, just so we make sure we understand what we're talking about, what does he mean when he says the harvest? What's Jesus talking about? Is he a a bivocational farmer? Is it his side hustle? And he's like, guys, I know we're like, we're talking about Jesus stuff right now, but the corn is ready. And so like, we need to do that after we finish Bible study. Like, no, that's not what he's talking about. Okay. Was it a Thanksgiving message and he pulled out a cornucopia as the centerpiece on the table? 
And he said, the harvest is plentiful. No. What's he talking about? You, you know. What's he talking about? People. Human beings created in his image that he loves. Souls. Jesus loves people. He loves souls. And Jesus can see supernaturally, though he is fully man, he's also fully God. And he could see in all the villages that he's about to start from wherever he's at to work his way towards Jerusalem. He's picturing every village, every room of every house, of every building. And he could see men and women and children. And when he looks out into them, what he sees is readiness. The harvest is plentiful. It's abundant. Lots of people. And he sees it. Um, we've been hearing about a new community that was announced not far from us here. And they're saying that it's going to be larger than Cinco Ranch. 50,000 people coming to an area just right down the road from us here in Richmond. And where you go out and see like literal crops growing on the ground right now, do you know what Jesus sees? He sees a harvest of souls. Your house right now, wherever it is, was probably built on some guy's pasture. There used to be cows there or crops there. And where some guy was out there, you know, harvesting stuff, what Jesus saw is that someday you were going to live there. Somebody was going to build a house there. And you'd be surrounded by people and in that neighborhood, there would be a ready harvest of souls. Um, as you think about Jesus saying this, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Just do an imagination exercise with me. What do you think the tone of his voice is? If you could just guess. What do you think the look or the expression on his face would be as he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few? I don't think it's the tone or the look of a greedy opportunist. I think it's a lovesick savior. That's what I think. Um, my grandfather uh, he, he's a gardener. And when I say gardener, he has like two acres and has a large garden. And then he outgrew that one and he wanted to do another small one. He retired when he was 55. He's now 94. He's still gardening, by the way. Um, he's been gardening for over 40 years. And so I grew up next door to him and I would see him out there. And whenever it was harvest time, Guess what he was doing? Harvesting. He was harvesting. I'd see him with a long bamboo pole, like knocking pears out of a tree because it was time. The pears are ready. They're ripe. And you know that if they sit there too long, they're not ready anymore. Like they're, they're just going to rot, right? And Jesus is using this metaphor, this picture, to tell us something about the readiness of human hearts. And, and here's, I'll just say it in my own words, and it's the first point. The workers are few, but many people are ready right now, right now, to be rescued by Jesus. The harvest has a ready right now connotation, that there are people all around us, and it's not like... You know, we assume they already know that Jesus, you know, died for them and he loves them. And they know the whole story. We assume that if they wanted to come to church, they would have just come already, right? And we assume all these things about them. But the reality is that they're ready right now. But they may not be ready just to walk into church. And they may not be ready to, uh, you know, go see a Christian movie or, or whatever opportunity they have. But they might be ready for you. For you. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. 
I was thinking about harvest time. And, um, you know, we've, we've made some amazing leaps as far as farming technology. You probably know that already. I, I just was curious, like, what is the, like, the latest, greatest? And there's this tractor called the John Deere X9. And uh, this thing is pretty sweet, okay? This, you can kind of see in the picture how, like, how wide the blade is on the front. So you can cover a lot of ground. But not only can you cover a lot of ground, like, really fast... It has air conditioning in this enclosed like bubble in the front. That's really cool, right? Not only that, in the video, because I had to watch the video about the John Deere X9, is that there's a guy, the farmer gets off and he, he controls it from his smartphone. It's automated. It's insane. Now, when Jesus is talking about harvest, is he talking about that? Okay, I found another picture online of what maybe Jesus has in his mind when he's thinking of harvesting. He's thinking about bugs crawling up your pants. You know what I'm saying? And like your fingers are bleeding because you like keep putting your hand into a plant that's pokey and, and you're like, ah, you know? And then you step in mud and your boots like, ah, it's like five pounds heavier all of a sudden, right? And then like that kind of thing. So I, I think the picture that he's painting for us is that this is kind of a mess, it's kind of a mess. But I wonder if many of our attempts in contemporary Christianity is more like the John Deere X9. Like, I'm going to post my service online while I sip my latte. People are going to come to Jesus. Probably not. Probably not. But it's going to take us getting our hands dirty, down in the mud, out on the muck of reality and loving people. Because they're ready right now. Um, we know harvesting is a mess because I'm a mess. And when, before I came to Jesus, I was really a mess. I'm still kind of a mess, but I was really a mess. Right? Just, just picture yourself before Jesus really got a hold of your life. And that's probably what we're talking about. Addicted, selfish, sometimes mean, really empty, maybe wounded, maybe deeply insecure. And that's where people live. And Jesus looks out and he sees them. And his heart's like, it's ready, guys. Right now. So here's the dilemma. The workers are few, but they're ready. So then he gives them two instructions for the dilemma. The first one is this, therefore, pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. The second point is this, the workers are few, so we'd better pray for more. That's what he's saying. People are ready. Right now, guys, in John 9, verse 1, he sends out the 12 disciples. Beautiful. He gives them very similar instructions. You can go back and read it. Then in John 10, what we just read, he gets 72 others, this wider group of disciples. And I'm just guessing it's going to be men and women that he's got following him. He said, okay, now you guys, I want you to go out two by two, and, and, and I want you to go. But here's the thing, you going, like the 12 and the 72, like that's, that's great, but it's not enough. The need is so great. And the fields are so ripe and they're so ready that the first thing I actually need you to do is you need to pray for more. You need to pray for more disciples because the harvest is so big. And what else do you do when you are completely out of your depth? You pray, right? You know, oh God, help me. I have no idea what to do with this. Please, Lord, come through, break through, help us, right? Because you know you're out of your depth. And that's what he's saying. Look, this is so big. And, and you're going to do great. You're going to do great things, guys. Just, you know, go. But you, you need more. You've got to pray. And this is interesting to me because we're people who believe in the sovereignty of God, Right? God is sovereign. But if God knows there's a dilemma, 
which is people are ready right now and there's not enough workers. Why would you have people pray? Wouldn't you just skip that step in your sovereignty and say, I'm just gonna give you more workers. I already knew you needed it. They're on the way, guys. More workers are coming. No, no need to pray. Why in the world would he command them? It's an imperative, by the way. Why would he command them to pray when he already knows the need? It's a good question. Here's what I think the answer is. That just like when Jesus created Adam and Eve in a garden, and he wanted to walk with him in the cool of the day as he was doing work, I think Jesus has the same heart for us today. He's looking for partners. He's looking for partners. He's looking not to just go, warm, everyone's saved, awesome, praise God. No, no. He's like, the way I'm going to do this is I'm not going to overwhelm them with some sort of crazy thing and like get them all saved at once. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to use you. And you're going to feel like there's no way I could ever do that. I'm not the right person. I think you meant to call someone else to do that because it's not me, you know, because I don't know what I'm talking about most of the time. And I say it wrong and I'm, and I'm kind of shy and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and we come up with all the excuses and he says, no, 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 no. Here's the plan. It's you. Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to use you. And what I need you to do is that I need you to start by praying. Because you can't do it alone. John Wesley said it this way. God does nothing but an answer to prayer. When God wants something done in the earth, one of the first things he does is he begins to stir up prayer around that. There was a man by the name of Charles Finney. You may have heard of Charles Finney. He was a very famous uh, evangelist, a revivalist in, uh, in New York. It was kind of the primary place that he was working. And over 500,000, like a, a half million Americans, when America was a much smaller place, came to know Jesus through the work of Charles Finney. But Charles Finney, it, it wasn't his preaching that was so awesome. He was a good preacher. But what the secret of their ministry was is that he had met a man by the name of, and I want to make sure I get this guy's name right. It's because he's one of the people that you never hear about, Daniel Nash. Daniel Nash was a man who had been a minister, and he had caught this, uh, it was a very serious eye disease, and what it did is it basically made him sit in the dark for like, you know, weeks and weeks on end. And in the midst of being stuck, trapped in a room in the dark, Daniel Nash became a serious prayer warrior. One of the stories was that there was a, a, a bar owner in their area of Eden Mills, and this bar owner was especially, um, I, I don't know, cantankerous towards Christians. He, he, he would, he would, you know, verbally mock them. He would um, persecute them. He, in his establishment, was known for, obviously, drunkenness and all kinds of immorality. And he was sort of like the notorious, like, anti-Christian person in their town. And Daniel Nash heard about him, and he created a list. And it was almost like the hit list. You know, like the mobsters, like they have the hit list. But his was like a prayer list. And he's like, he's going on my list. And so Charles Finney puts on a meeting, a revival meeting, and the bar owner comes to the meeting, and he's really uncomfortable and fidgety the whole time. And Charles Finney's like, there's something going on with this guy. And finally, he motions and says, can I share something? And Charles Finney, man of faith, is like, sure, go ahead, which I would never do that, by the way, but maybe I should learn from Charles Finney. And the man openly repents of his sins in front of everyone. And nothing changed except for one thing. Daniel Nash prayed. And so three to four weeks before every revival meeting, Daniel Nash would go with one or two other people, and he would just go and begin to cry out for the people of that area 
They said that sometimes you could hear his prayers from a half mile away. He was literally crying out. And the secret to breakthrough in their ministry was not amazing preaching. It wasn't like a, a great like tent. It was prayer. It was prayer. God, when he does something, when he wants something done on the earth, he raises up prayer. Prayer is our strategic partnership with God in his rescue mission. The workers are few, so we'd better pray. And here's the cool thing about praying. He is the Lord of the harvest. Meaning, like he's not just the Lord over here, and then there's all this lost people that are doing crazy stuff over here. And it's like, they're just like, he's not interacting with that. It's like, no, no, he's here with the people already working in their lives. He's the Lord of the harvest and it's his harvest. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send workers into his harvest. Here at our church, we talk about our regular prayer and worship gatherings. We talk about Awaken Houston that we just finished. We talk about our Good Friday service. The reason why we do that is we believe that the key to effective ministry is prayer. So that's the first instruction. The second instruction he gives them for this dilemma is this. Now go. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Here's the third point. The workers are few, so we better get to work. We better get to work. And I like this because Jesus is a little bit, I feel like he's like a little tricky here, right? Guys, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray. Now go. So you prayed, and you're the answer to your prayers, <laughs> right? I, I, I just tricked you, but you are supposed to go too. Go. Now Go. Uh, I, I want to look at the, the second half of this next week and talk specifically about how does he tell them to go. But I'm just curious about you as we talk about going. Like, what does that do on the inside of your heart? What feelings begin to come to the service as you think about you going? What about you? Will you join the harvest work. And here's what I was thinking of as I was studying this this week. When Jesus is telling them to pray for more workers, where are those workers currently that he's asking them to pray for? Well, we know that there were no such thing as seminaries. They weren't at seminary getting trained to become workers. There were not other local churches around the world that would be preparing people to go and do mission work. So they weren't there. The workers, they're in the harvest. And right now, the workers that we need to reach 2,325 people are out in the 2,325 people. Does that make sense? And it's by going that we actually begin to find the ones that God's calling already. The workers that we're praying for, they're already out there in the harvest. But we have to go first. We have to go first. And so we have this dilemma. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And many of them are ready right now to be rescued by Jesus, so we better pray and we better get to work. Now, what does that mean practically for us? Let's talk about that. What does this sending mean for us as a church body? What does it mean for us to be people who take this truth and actually apply it to us? Well, the first thing is this. We join the Lord in the sending. We join him in the sending. Um, this past 
uh, Sunday, we sent out our friends Jason and Holly, and we actually got to be together around them and to send them out into their next assignment. Now, I just want you to know that if you're not used to church life, like that's kind of rare. Because what happens a lot of times is when someone like Key in that church, a leader is going to move on, churches kind of minimize that because they're afraid that people are going to leave if, if that person leaves. And we decided that's dumb, right? And if you need to go help them in their next thing, go. We'll send you to, amen? Right? That's dumb. We need to be people who join in the sending we send missionaries out on mission trips. We had a team that got to go to Nicaragua this past summer, and they had an amazing time. And I believe that God did something in them while they were serving that has impacted us here just by sending. Uh, right now, like this morning at 7 a.m., we dropped off my son, Will, to go on a mission trip to Arkansas. In the afternoons, they're also going to be mountain biking, which would be really cool, but... They're going to go serve as high school students at a nonprofit in Arkansas. We send missionaries. We also send church plants. Do you think that we could fit 2,325 people in this room right now? It ain't going to happen. We'd have to have five bazillion services, and I would be in a nut house, okay? <laughs> that would be terrible. But you know what we could do? We can plant churches. We plant churches. That's how the gospel spread. They would go into a town, reach new people, form a church. All right, you guys good? Cool, see ya. Go on to the next town, reach some people. You guys good? Awesome, see ya. And they would go from place to place and they would plant churches. We, uh, we're a church plant. We were sent out by our sending church. We have been a part of the sending out of Koinonia Church, Josue Sanchez. That's now, they're now meeting. And we've been, we gave money to him. We've been praying for Jose at Koinonia Church. We got to be a part of John Henson at the Gathering Church. And we gave them money and we prayed for them and we brought them up here in front of you guys and we send them out. We love you, we're with you because we want to be about church planting. We join also in the sending by our praying. We have to pray about these things. We join in the sending by our giving, really, by giving. Our church plant started with a gift of $70,000 from our sending church. And that $70,000 didn't descend magically from heaven one day. And they're like, thank you, Jesus. We're going to give it to a church plant. No, no, no. The $70,000 was in the checking accounts of the people of that church. And they said, no, no, we believe we're going to give towards this. We join in the sending by our giving. We regularly give right now to Hope Project Nicaragua. We have partners in Pakistan that are doing amazing work, gospel work, and then like humanitarian work. We have Adam and Laura Watson in London who are working with churches to help them reach a, a growing Muslim population in London. We have uh, Janaki in India, who's doing all kinds of amazing things. We have our friends at Koinonia Church that we mentioned. We have the Houston Church Planning Network that we give to every year. We have Acts 29, which is about church planting both in the States and across the globe that we give money to. We have our friends at Attack Poverty that we give to. Mercy Goods, the San Felipe Baptist Association. They're helping with church planting and revitalization in our area. We have the O2 Network. We have local opportunities through Jane Long and other places. Like we are a church, even though we're not a big church yet, we're a church already that we are joining in the sending by giving, by resourcing amazing people. So we join the Lord in the sending. The second thing is this. We send out house churches. Right now, we have seven house churches. This is not a big church, by the way. But we have seven house churches. That's amazing. And on top of that, we have Rise Student Ministry that's meeting in a house, and it's kind of like a house church right now for youth. So we really kind of have eight house churches, 
And I was just thinking, like, if, if we saw 2,325 people, just one out of every 100 people that came to know Jesus and we helped them walk with God and grow in community and live on mission, if we could see that happen, that would be at least 47 new house churches. Wow. It's a lot. We send out leaders two by two, and they open up their homes, not because it's convenient to open up your home every week, right? But because the harvest is plentiful. We take the work of our church, and we take it to the street, onto your street, and your house becomes a place of harvesting. Our house churches, by the way, they're not closed groups. They're all about, you know, come and just only grow deep. But actually, we know that we grow deeper by actually opening the doors and saying, no, no, we want more people to come in. Invite our neighbors, invite our friends, invite our coworkers. Let them come. We want them to know about new life in Jesus. Somehow that deepens us. It deepens us. So we have a vision to send out house churches and house church leaders. The third thing is this. We live as sent ones. We live the sent out life. And this is the real paradigm shift, I think, for us. Because we grow up in America, most of us, and we, we see church in a certain way. We think of ministry in a certain way. And we think if they want to go to church, they'll just come to church. If they want to know more, they'll ask us. We, we, we think about it in that way, and there's this, this paradigm shift, and we see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, and here's what Paul says. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in Christ's triumphal procession, and through us spreads, get this, the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. To live sent is to carry the scent of Jesus everywhere, in every place. Um, I hang out often at Block House. Because of that, I've gotten to know some of the people that hang out in there. And there's a young man there who who works there. And I really like this young man. And I'm fairly certain that he does not know Jesus. And one day I'm talking to him. And he's like, man, I'm just so stressed out. I'm burnt out. And I just feel like I I need a day off. And I was like, you mean like a Sabbath? And he goes, a what? He did not compute. I was like, you know, like in the Bible, it talks about God creates the earth in six days. And on the seventh day, he tells people to rest from their work. Because it it was actually part of his created order that you need rest in your life. God created you to need that rest. What was I doing right there? I was like, and give your life to Jesus right now. Romans chapter three, you're a sinner, right? No, 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 no. All I'm saying is like, you're recognizing already that God created you in a certain way. And all I wanna do is connect that dot with Jesus. Dot connected. Yeah, just living as a sent one. There's another young man who's in real estate, and this dude is intense. He's like one of those CrossFit people. Do we have any CrossFit people in the room? A few of you? No? No? No CrossFit? They go to the other church. <laughs> I, don't, I don't give off a CrossFit vibe, so they don't go here, you know. I'm going to start doing deadlifts during my sermons. <laughs> yeah. um, this guy's intense, and, you know, he's got a book that's like about 10x, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm like, oh, cool. Like, tell me about your book right there. And he says, well, this guy is saying that, like, if you'll, if you'll focus your energy on, like, the things that really matter, then, like, it's all going to grow. I was like, wow. This guy might be a Christian. And he's looking at me like, what are you talking about? I was like, that's exactly what Jesus did. You know, his whole mission was to pour into people and those people would take his message and his love and they would give it to other people. And like he focused hardcore on disciples so that when he left, like he would go and his, his ministry like literally changed the entire world. And all I did 
was take this guy's desire for his career and for impact, and I just took that little dot and I connected it to Jesus. Simple, simple things. I didn't have to know the Roman road by heart so I could lead him, right? Just living as a sent one. And here's what I want you to know. You can do that. If I can do that, you can do that. Really. It's that simple to live as a sent one. Let me close with this. Jesus has this little phrase, and you probably thought, oh, he's probably not going to touch on that because that's weird. And this was the phrase. I'm sending you out like sheep among, among wolves. Now, if I'm coaching a little league team and I'm psyching up my players for the big game, I'm going to circle them up. Like, come on, guys, come on. Guys. Shh, shh, shh. Listen, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. This team is large, they're ferocious, and you might die. Everyone's hands in. Go Christians on three. One, two, three. Go Christians. Jesus is not trying to psych them up at this moment. I'm thinking. Because if I'm them, I'm like, whoa, 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 what? I'm sending you out to get killed. But here's the thing. In an age of spin, in salesmanship, in marketing, in five ways to improve your life, what you need to know about Jesus is he's like, for real. There's no spin, there's no salesmanship, there's no slick presentation, there's no like, and this is gonna make your life so much better if you do this. He's like, no, no, this is gonna be hard. This is gonna be hard. And you're gonna need to be alert. You're gonna need to be wise. And you're gonna need to be together. Because wolves like to get sheep off by themselves. And remember, I'm sending you out two by two, and there's a reason for that. I want you to stay together because you do not need to be off by yourself with a wolf. Amen? Some of you singles might just need to hear that right now. Take your chaperone, okay? Two by two. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. But here's the other thing. It really is almost like you could die out there, kind of a warning. But here's the thing for them. They already knew what it was like to be dead. They remembered when they were dead in their sins. They remembered what it was like when they were darkened in their understanding, when their hearts were so empty and they were so miserable and they couldn't figure out why and they knew what it was to be really alive already. And as Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ and yet I live, meaning you cannot kill what's already been crucified. You cannot take what has already been given. You can't. And these are people who understood that their savior was also their shepherd. And the only, the only um, defense mechanism for a sheep is called a shepherd. Amen? And so Jesus is telling them, look, this is going to be hard. And, and I was thinking about these guys, is that who on, on, on earth would stick their neck out for a shepherd like this? Like, what kind of ship, sheep would stick out their neck for a shepherd unless they knew that that shepherd was going to stick out their neck, his neck for them? He was going to die for them. He's going to take their punishment. He was going to pay for their sins. And by his resurrection, he was going to give them new life. And it was the love of Christ that was compelling them, not the fear of man. Amen. Amen. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Let's pray and let's go and let's live the sent out life. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Renaissance Church Sermon Podcast. To support our work, you can like, share, subscribe, or you can donate at rin-church.org.